Farmer Penny. You get left in a lecture theatre one night after falling asleep whilst slumped down low on a seat. Your predicament is detected by a passing alien spaceship that beams down an alien robot. When it materialises in the lecture theatre, it wakes you up. And it proceeds to communicate to you by showing you this film. The halting problem is really famous, not just in the field of mathematics, but also in the field of computer science. The intriguing and easy to understand proof is supposed to demonstrate a task that computers find impossible to do. But are we fooling ourselves? And would a visitor from another world disagree with our clever sounding proof? In 1928, the influential German mathematician David Hilbert challenged the world's leading mathematicians to answer questions such as Is mathematics complete? Is mathematics consistent? And is mathematics decidable? This third problem of decidability went by the German name of Entscheidungsproblem Please excuse the pronunciation which means decision problem in English the decision problem was addressed in 1936 by the American Alonzo Church with something called Lambda Calculus and in the same year by Alan Turing with something called the halting problem. These two solutions are thought to contain equivalent logic just expressed in different forms. And the underlying logic is considered to be closely related to Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorems of 1931. The easiest of these to understand is Alan Turing's halting problem. Any computer program with given input data must either finish nicely and stop, or else go into an inescapable loop, which is the type of thing where we might need to resort to switching it off and on again. It would be nice to have a way to know beforehand if the software is bound to go into a loop. But Turing devised a proof to show that it was impossible to determine if a program would finish nicely or go into a loop. But not everyone agrees that Turing's proof is valid. Someone who strongly contests the logic of the halting problem proof is Tara Kam. She is an alien robot who has been acquiring knowledge about mankind. Of course, she agrees that if we could determine if a program loops or halts, then we could solve other unsolved problems such as the Goldback conjecture. The Goldback conjecture states that every even number greater than 2 is the sum of two prime numbers. For example, the number 10 is a sum of two primes, 7 and 3, or 5 plus 5. And up to at least the time of this recording, nobody has been able to provide a valid proof for the Goldback conjecture. Now suppose we could have a machine that could figure out if a program with its input data is going to finish nicely or go into a loop. Then we could design a computer program based on the Goldback conjecture the program could test each even number greater than 2 to see if it was a sum of two primes and the program would simply stop when it finds an even number that is not the sum of two primes. We simply pop this program into our halt loop decider and it will determine if it will halt in which case the Goldback conjecture is false or if it loops in which case the Goldback conjecture is true. But Alan Turing devised a proof from which he concluded that it was impossible to devise a halt or loop decider. And his proof goes like this. It starts by claiming that all programs must either halt or loop. For example, if we've got a machine that runs program A, which loops if its input is 42, but which halts for all other inputs. Then say we input number 7. It will print OK and stop. 
but if we input 42, it gets stuck in a loop and it looks like we're going to have to switch it off and on again. In the next stage of the proof, we assume that a halt loop detector program can exist. And we'll call this program, program H. So if we feed into H, the program A and the number 42, then the halt loop decider will determine that program A will loop. An important aspect of this halt loop decider is that it should never get stuck in a loop itself. The next stage of the proof is the clever bit, where we show we can build a program that we'll call program X, that is able to contradict the output of program H. We start with a piece of code that we'll call functionality C, which simply makes two copies of its input. These two copies can feed into functionality H, which is our halt loop decider. And the output of functionality H goes into functionality D, which does the opposite of what its input says. So, if its input says it will loop, then functionality D will simply print OK and then stop. But if its input says it will halt, then D itself will go into a loop. These three pieces of functionality are combined into one program that we call Program X. Now, here's the really clever bit. We use the code of Program X as input to itself. The copier then makes two copies of Program X, which will feed into the functionality of our whole loop decider H. And so if H decides it will loop, then this goes into functionality D, which forces it to halt. And so the final state of Program X would appear to contradict the output of H. And if H says it will halt, then the functionality of D will go into a loop, which again appears to contradict the output of H. And the contradictions mean that program H cannot exist. You might want to stop at this point and think about this for a while. After some thought, you might form the opinion that this is a really clever and highly inventive proof. On the other hand, you might get the impression that you've been tricked somehow by a very slippery sounding argument. Now is a good time to have a quick discussion about halting. Some heavy duty computer programs that are going to take a few hours to run might prompt you if they should shut down the machine when it's finished. And if you say yes, the software will explicitly cause the machine to halt which is very different to just ending its processing. Indeed, even with Alan Turing's imagined computer, which we call a Turing machine, the halt state is explicitly selected. And so, Tara proposes that when we execute a section of code on a machine, then the final processing state is not just halt or loop, but can be one of three categories. The first category is an inescapable loop that we might call the loop category. The second category is where we have a machine level halt, such as a shutdown instruction. And we might call this the halt category. And the third category is where the processing exits the section of code without doing a halt or a loop. And so we might call this the exit category. A key point about this exit category is that the processing is allowed to continue after the end of the section of code. And if there is no other software on the machine, so there's no operating system for example, then it's down to the design of the machine itself what it will do after the last program instruction has completed. It might decide to halt, or it might decide to start again from the first instruction, in which case the machine itself could cause an otherwise exiting program to go into a loop. And so if we've got three categories instead of two, the question, does it halt or loop, could be considered to be misleading. If we were being generous, we might consider that the term halt refers to all states apart from the loop state. So it could include both categories, stop the machine 
as well as exit the code. So we might describe the halting problem as a problem about categorization. A certain program plus its data might be classified as a certain type of loop, whereas another program with its data might be described as a different type of loop. But when it comes to program H, the halt loop decider, we simply say it must halt. We don't specify a specific type of halting. But Tara claims that if we did specify one of these two types of halting, just described, then if program H goes into the category of halts by simply exiting the code, then we can show that we can construct a program X that can contradict its output. In other words, we can prove that program H can't have an exit type of halt. However, if we say that program H halts by doing a machine level halt, then we can't construct a program X and we no longer hit any contradictions. And so under this category, it remains a possibility that program H could exist. Tara thinks that most humans get tricked by the illusion that program X creates. She thinks that when they try to figure out what happens inside program X, after H receives its input, it can seem like functionality H would examine the code of program X and see that it needs to include functionality H, which in turn would need to have an input of program X, and so on and so on. And so it creates the illusion of having to endlessly fetch more and more data. A problem, it would appear, that functionality H can't do anything about. But Tara believes that with an explicit halt instruction, this scenario is not a looping scenario at all. It's a halting scenario. Let's say this program H with the machine level halt does actually exist. And we call this program the real H. Next, let's say that program X exists and we'll consider what logic needs to be inside program H in order to avoid getting trapped by program X. At some point in the code, program H might ask the question, does it try to execute an exact copy of my functionality? And if it does, then program X could print out, it will halt and then do a machine level halt. And remember that this halt will stop the machine so you can think of it as being a shutdown instruction. Now the H functionality inside program X has to be one of two possibilities. Either it contains a faithful reproduction of real H's logic with its machine level halting, or it must contain an attempt to reproduce the functionality of H but without machine level halting. Let's first consider the scenario where it does contain machine level halting. Then within program X, after functionality H has produced its output, it will do a machine level halt that will force program X to stop. So it will never reach functionality D that tries to do the opposite of what H says, which means it will not be able to contradict the output of functionality H. The only other possibility that remains is that program X contains some attempt to produce the same functionality as H, but without the machine level halting. Remember, the problem for program X is that the real H can say it will halt, and then force processing to stop with a machine level halt. And so in order to prevent that machine halt happening, we would need to use an altered copy of program H inside program X that we'll call pretend program H. And to ensure that we can continue processing after this pretend program H, we would need to get rid of any machine level halt instructions. We would need to change them to some type of instruction or instructions that would return control to program X. But this seemingly minor alteration would, in reality, be a major deviation from the real functionality 
of real H because now it will respond completely differently to the question, does it execute a faithful reproduction of my functionality? So after the copier has sent its output to the pretend H functionality, the pretend H functionality will conclude that program X does execute a faithful reproduction of its own functionality. Whereas the logic in real program H will conclude that program X does not execute a faithful reproduction of its own functionality. And so the real halt loop detector can treat this version of program X the same as any other program because this program X does not try to execute a faithful reproduction of H's functionality. It seems to be impossible to construct a properly working program X that can contradict a real program H. And so the argument that a working H could be contradicted appears to be flawed. Humans often try to get around the problem by talking about things like emulation, simulation, sandboxes and so on. But these just involve the creation of extra layers of code that can create enough obfuscation for humans to fool themselves into believing that they can accurately reproduce the functionality of real H without doing a real machine level halt. But the bottom line is that either we include an explicit machine level halt instruction that prevents further processing or we don't. There is no way around this fact. Tara believes it can help to step back and think about what we are ultimately trying to achieve with Program H and Program X. First consider Program H. Here we are trying to determine if a program plus its data will go into an inescapable loop or not. Now consider Program X. Here it seems we are trying to construct a program that will contradict its own nature. If program X is going to loop, we need it to not loop. But if it's not going to loop, we need it to loop. So the functionality we are trying to achieve for program X appears to be absurd. From this perspective, Tara believes it's obvious that program X cannot ever be constructed meaning that mankind's use of this logic to try to prove undecidability is never going to work. Our friendly alien robot, Tara, proposes that the idea that we can construct a fully working program X that will contradict H is a false proposition. And that the human's proof of the halting problem's undecidability must be wrong. But of course Tara must be wrong, because if she weren't, then it would mean that for the best part of a century, the world's cleverest mathematicians, and computer scientists for that matter, have failed to spot the simple issue that there can be two types of halt. And if a simple proof like this can be wrong, then we can't really have any confidence in the validity of any mathematical proof. And so, as a human yourself, do you agree with your fellow humans? Or do you agree with Tara, the alien robot? The final decision is yours.